welcome sports fans as I'm joined today by Donovan Bennett. I'm Kevin Garbuio and we're here to talk some CIS football on the Rouge Radio Podcast. Thanks for joining us today, Donovan. Thanks for having me. So this weekend there was some big matchups that oh West. We're gonna start out West first with Calgary winning sixty five to six against Alberta. Calgary's offense this year seems to be rolling and they seem to be the favorite in the in the Western Division. What was the key to that game, aside from Eric Dzelisky going off with 265 yards passing? Well, to me, when you look at Calgary, especially offensively, I mean, they've got the best two-deep depth chart in the country. Uh, you know, I have them 1-2 with Mac every week in my top 10. so close. I lean towards Mac because they've got the better quarterback, but they're so, so deep. Uh, their offensive line is, is ridiculous, and they've got one of the best, if not the best, running backs in the country in Lavala uh, running behind them. But as their running game gets a lot of hype, Brett Blasco, I believe, should be a first-team All-Canadian by the end of this year if he stays healthy. He helps them stretch the field, and it, it was a great, great performance for them once again. They look like they're already in peak condition. And speaking of great quarterbacks, Regina beating UBC, that was one of the best quarterback matchups going into it, having Mark Mueller against incoming heck, the incoming Heck Creighton winner, Billy Green. What allowed Regina to take over now UBC in an 0-2 hole? Well, for me, styles make fights. It's a great boxing term. And you look at these two, as you said, great QBs in two different styles. And Billy Green, the heck winner, he's more of like the Tim Tebow of the CIS. He wants to help that run game. He energizes his teammates. He wants to keep games close with their great defense. And then he'll win them late. Whereas Mark Mueller, he just wants to throw it all over the park. He's like the CIS version of Danny McManus. He just likes to win it. And he's got some great receivers and what happened really was UBC got down and they had to throw and they got out of what makes them good and what makes really Billy Green good. He had to throw it around the park 33 times. That's not a recipe for success for him or that offense completed less than 50% with only 15 completions. And Mark Mueller was just playing Sandlot football. They were getting free releases. And when you look at the three great Canadian receivers they have playing in the CFL out of the Regina uh, program, They've got some more coming through the pipeline in Solomon and Janata and Snyder. And this offense, if Mark Mueller is healthy, is pretty scary. And in the final matchup of this weekend in the in the Western Conference, we have Manitoba slipping past Saskatchewan, winning the game 31-28. Manitoba now 2-0. and What's the key to that? their success this year? Not many people had them very high up on their list coming into the year. Now they're going to be creeping up in the CIF top ten. Well, they're a team that was, as you mentioned, not counted on for big things. But when you look a little bit more closely, I wasn't really shocked by this outcome or by their start. They're a team with a lot of veterans, 50-year seniors. They've got one of the most electrifying players in the country in Anthony Combs. And whenever he touches the ball from wherever on the field, he can go the distance. And as I mentioned, the seniors, this was a team after the uh, the university clock rule where you only had a certain amount of time uh, after you graduate high school to play uh, CIS football, they lost a lot of uh, would-be recruits that would have come from junior football. Now I think that's got out of their system. Uh, they're recruiting across the country, and now they're back to the level that they were at. Maybe not not quite at the level they're at in 07 when they won a Vanier Cup, which was a, an older veteran team, and they used to benefit from having those older kids. Uh, now they've changed their recruiting practices, and, and now you're seeing t- the, the fruits of some of Brian Doby's labor and his 17th year uh, heading up the Manitoba Bisons. We'll get a real litmus test to see how far they've come uh, next week as they've got Calgary for their homecoming. Calgary at Manitoba next week. That'll be the game that we're going to preview. Calgary coming into the game, the offensive juggernaut. Manitoba this year, as we mentioned, was under the radar, but for various reasons, they're very successful. This is This could kind of be the pretender or the contender game for Manitoba. And if I'm Manitoba and I'm watching film, I'm seeing a Calgary team that I want to stop the run early. And they struggled against Saskatchewan stopping the run. Gave up 167 on the ground. That's not going to get it done this week when Mr. Lombala and company come to town. So I expect uh, to, to see a loaded box, seven, eight, maybe at times 
nine, bringing in some safeties into the box and forcing uh, that Calgary offense who likes to play action pass and, and throw that way, forcing them to on first down, spread the field and make games throwing the ball. Well, Calgary, how many teams can say they lose their two running backs and then the best running back was actually the third one, quotations around the third back with Stephen Limbaugh just having a great year so far. Now we move to Ontario where there's some big scores again in the, in the Ontario Conference in the OUA, McMaster beating up on Waterloo 68-21. McMaster looking like the team to beat. I know they're playing some weaker opponents, the weaker opponent in Waterloo, but they're still managing to show that they're the team. And this was on the road for McMaster, a veteran ball club, and not afraid to take their game on the road. And Waterloo actually was up in this ball game at a 7 nothing lead. And for a while in the first quarter, it was tied 7-7. But, uh, you know, the defending Vanier Cup champions, they're not going to get scared because they had a subpar, a quarter of football. And the the riches that John Behe and that offensive staff have. You got Mike DeCroce, you know, arguably the best receiver in the country down for an injury. You have Chris Pizzetta, a great freshman last year, was looking for big things from him in his sophomore year as their running back. He's down for the year and they're still able to put up uh yards and big, big games and put up sixty eight points uh, on a Waterloo team. Uh Mac again, when you bring back uh, nineteen starters on offense and defense, you expect them to be pretty good early, and they were. So with Western beating up on Toronto this weekend, is it showing that Toronto last week, the week it was a bit of a fluke, or is that Western still top dog in the OUA and ready to take their crown from McMaster? Well, I think it, it, Toronto's taking baby steps. So they've they've come to a place where they're a pretty tough team to play at home at the you know relatively still new Varsity Stadium. Uh, but to really mature and have a veteran ball club, you know, like McMaster, you have to take that performance and duplicate it on the road in a hostile environment and and. Uh, at Western with, with uh, the freshman orientation week and a, and a big crowd, uh, you know, some of those young players that have only been in the system for one and two years under Coach Gary uh, were, were probably in awe of the atmosphere. Um, and Western, the question marks about them coming into the season was, Who's going to run the ball, and will Donnie Marshall be able to do more than run the ball? Well, Donnie Marshall has been very efficient passing the ball. We've seen no ill effects of the high ankle sprain that hobbled him at the end of the year. And Garrett Sanvito, a guy who was catching passes from Donnie Marshall uh, a year ago, has done sensational things uh, rushing the football. I mean, he's got a great offensive line to, to run it behind, but, you know, very economical 15 carries, 109 yards, two touches. Uh, it, it seems like they're rolling once again in London. And the Ottawa this week losing 36-47 to York. York is a team on the rise, and they're starting to make some big moves. All the listeners to the show know we've been very high on Miles Gibbon here. Miles Gibbon having a great game for York. But what to deal with Ottawa right now is uh, word is that they're running the wing T offense, and they haven't been able to get too much going in the pass attack. Well, I mean, the, the word is correct. That's exactly what they're doing. And these are two programs uh, that are going in different directions. Uh, York is kind of ascending, and their arrow is pointing up. And, and Ottawa, even though it's a veteran uh, ball club, uh, their arrow is pointing down, and it's tough. You had Gary Echeverry, who came in there late in uh, the recruiting process, didn't really get much uh, in this class as far as recruiting. They've got a lot of fifth-year guys, but they're playing an offense that they've never, ever – played in before not at the university level at any level and they're playing a legit wing tee they've got seven offensive linemen uh in a three-point stance with no splits in between each other they've got two wide receivers about 15 yards off the ball getting a running start and they've got uh you know galander is one of the best running backs in the country um you know and playing a wing position and taking handoffs from all types of angles that you wouldn't be accustomed to. And football is such a game of habit. And to be playing a pretty archaic offense in the Canadian Football League, it's tough for these football players who've been playing the game for 10, 15, 12 years to adjust to it. The issue for Ottawa is, you know, part of the benefit of playing such a, a dynamic, exotic offense is that teams wouldn't be able to prepare for it early in the year. There's not a lot of tape on it, and you'd be able to take advantage of that early. Well, that hasn't happened. They've gone 0-2. Now there's some tape of what 
they're doing, and it hasn't been effective. And you've got Aaron Colvin, a veteran quarterback. They haven't got much, you know, throwing the ball, but they haven't attempted to throw it very often. He only ha- has, in most sets, two receivers to throw to. And, again, he attempted 16 passes to 40 runs against York. Uh, they ran the ball 55 times against Waterloo two weeks ago. And that's uh, – sorry, against Windsor two weeks ago. And that's a game where they were behind for much of it. So, uh, it clearly, um, they've got to iron – some things out, uh, but a great, great performance for York uh, to to hang up, uh, even though Ottawa has been struggling, to hang up 47 points on, on, a, on a team that, let's not forget, a couple of years ago was in the Yates Cup and was a playoff team last year. I mean, I don't know if, if some York fans thought this York offense was going to be able to put up 47 points combined throughout the year. But then came, as you mentioned, the savior, Gibbon. Coach Falls, the offensive coordinator, really likes him. He says he would take him over any other quarterback in the conference, including Kyle Quinlan. So that's quite the statement of the athletic ability that this young man has. Well, they see, they had two big, big 99-yard drives back-to-back to seal the game for, for the York Lions some of that we haven't really seen or do since the days of Andre Dury. So this probably this would probably be the most dynamic player they've had since that era. Yeah, no question. I got a, a question on Twitter. Uh, you know, is Gibbon greater than Dury? And I, I we have to kind of you know qualm some of that hype. It's pretty early. You know, he's had two games. Dury had a couple great years, and for me, he's the best player uh, to put on the red, white, and black for York. Well, the big upset, I thought, in the OUA, probably not a shock to you because you've been high on Guelph all year, is Guelph defeating Windsor. Windsor building after that dominating performance by Austin Kennedy against Ottawa. Went down, uh, down to earth a bit, but 244 yards isn't, isn't anything to laugh at. Still having a great game, but Guelph, 28-9, stopping the offense. No touchdown yeah. scored by Windsor. I, it, 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 I'm not surprised that Guelph won. I am surprised on how they won. I mean, you, you're talking about Austin Kennedy, a guy for me that with Kyle Quinlan suspended last year, I thought if I had a vote, which I don't, he was a, a candidate for the Heck in a year ago. Um, and through six touchdown passes last week, had nine total points this week. Quite the turnaround. And Guelph, they've had trouble on special teams in years past having trouble finding a kicker to replace Rod Maver. Well, Daniel Ferraro from Niagara Falls said, this job is mine. Five field goals. I'm sure they would have liked to finish uh, more when they got in the red zone. That's something that Coach Galloway, the offensive coordinator in Guelph, really preaches. But another performance from uh, Jazz Lindsay, who's growing into the position as he was a late starter, uh, taking over for Chris Rossetti late in the year last year. And again, Guelph is a team that, you know, they're – arrow is pointing up the more seasoning that Lindsay gets uh, and the more understanding that he gets with his great receivers like Dimitrov who made a big touchdown catch for him and obviously his his brother uh, Saxon Lindsay uh, they're going to be a scary team and, and a team I wouldn't want to face uh, down the stretch and the uh, university rush game that you guys covered on the score Queens beating up on Laurier 42-16 Queens this year looking like they might be a team that can contend for the OEA championship. And Laurier, they seem to be in a bit of a rebuilding year with their quarterback, Travis Eland, kind of being left alone and to fight for himself right now. Yeah, I mean, we'll start with Queens, another nice performance. And, you know, seeing York's win, their week one win over York looks even more impressive now, but they were very impressive in front of the national TV audience on University Rush. And they, you just look at their two deep, they've got guys who are potential OUA All-Stars and All-Canadians in every level of the football game, and they didn't really lose much. They returned 20 starters from a very good team on defense. Osi Okwoma and Frank Pankowicz are tough guys to replace, but they still have great players on defense and a great scheme uh, that Pat Tracy coaches them up real well, and Travis Eamon learned what tough defense in the CIS is all about. If he thought that Toronto defense that shut him out was tough. He got a real baptism by fire by the Queens defense. And Laurier showed flashes offensively, but it was just the breakdowns that they had, especially leading into the half, two big interceptions that turned into uh, two Queens scores. And when you have a 
an offense that's that potent and a guy like Gramberg that's getting handoffs from a guy with an arm like Billy McPhee, you can't spot them one field position and two points. Queens looks very good so far. I'm interested to see how they fare against a team that's going to be fighting for them possibly for a home field in uh, the semifinals in the OUA playoffs or, or possibly home field in the Eighth Cup in the Western Mustangs next week. That would be the game where we're going to preview Western against Queens next week on University Rush. Rush. We know so much about Coach Pat Tracy, the defense coordinator, and his brilliant defense. Is, is Marshall going to be able to handle what they're going to be bringing this week? This will probably be the best defense that Western's faced so far. Do you think they're going to be able to adapt to that, or is this going to be Queens being able to take over on home field? Everyone knows how hard it is to play at Richardson Stadium. It, it's very difficult, and especially for this game, a rivalry game where the Western uh, fans will, will travel relatively well. And it, there's great players across the board uh, on all levels of the field. Uh, it, highly recruited kids, scholarship athletes, kids that expect to be OUA All-Stars and All-Canadians and win awards. So I think you hit the nail on the head. This game is going to be about scheme. And, you know, San Vito, as nice as he looked running the ball early, he hasn't faced a front four like Queens. They haven't given up a rushing touchdown so far this year. They didn't give up a rushing touchdown in all of last year's regular season. A pretty impressive feat. Uh, so, so we'll see how good he is. And on the other side of the ball, the chess match is a family one. Uh, Billy McPhee, the great quarterback for Queens, probably no one knows his football game better than his uncle, uh, Dennis McPhee, who's now the defensive coordinator of Western. Billy was going to go to Waterloo to be coached by Dennis McPhee, and obviously we know what happened there with the, uh, uh, with the steroid scandal and you know not being able to play for a year for the Warriors. That changed the course of both of those football projects. Dennis McPhee is now uh, at Western as a defensive coordinator, and Billy McPhee decided he needed to play right away, and he took his talent to Kingston. Uh, it, great chess matches on both ends, and I think it's going to be a great football game. Well, the big games this weekend in the queue were extremely exciting with – we had Bishops almost upsetting Laval. That's where I'd like to start with the Quebec Conference. Bishops almost defeating Laval, losing 28-22. What's up with Laval's offense? It seems to be really struggling right now. Yeah, and you know what? It, it, the whole country w was was paying attention to this game. It's almost like Laval is the villain in a movie. When a game's close or when they're down, everyone's cheering for someone to bring them. But if you want to beat Laval, you better do it on the road because they're impossible to beat at Pep Stadium. And Bishops had a chance. They just let it slip through their fingers. But as you mentioned, one of the reasons they had a chance is because they played good defense. And really, Laval struggled on offense. Only 10 of their points uh, were accounted for by their offense, of their 28 points. And those came at the end of the third quarter, a touchdown, and the beginning of the fourth quarter, a field goal. The rest were five safeties forced by the defense and one rouge. So their offense is, is struggling. But when you talk about replacing a guy like Trudeau and when you talk about replacing a guy like Sebastian Levesque, I mean, these guys are once-in-a-generation players, and we're seeing that they're struggling to get that consistency on offense. Fred Greek Plessius is back on defense, and that's why their defense is pretty good against the run. They averaged 57 yards against the run a year ago, which is ridiculous. In this game, they only gave up 56. Uh, some problems in the back end against Bishops, who has a great passing attempt. Uh, they got up 300 yards passing. The Heather brothers, Jordan and Nathan, the QB and wide receiver, respectively, hooked up for some big plays. L listen, let's not get crazy. Laval's going to be there at the end, but when you saw Glenn Constantine kind of chastise and challenge his football team on the field right after the game, they're chalking this up like a loss. They feel like they didn't play well because they need every opportunity to continue to play well in the Quebec Conference. Even though they know they have the better athletes, they have to be sharp for when that Montreal game rolls around and also when bowl games roll around. The other game, Montreal defeating Concordia, 48-10. A close game was only 17-10 at the half. Montreal blowing up. Is Montreal right now the team to beat in the queue? I don't. I wouldn't go that far, uh, but I think that gap is, is narrowing and it's getting closer. And you, this game was a great example. Concordia, quality opponent, and Montreal just dominated. They had 
over 300 more total yards of offense than Concordia did. And uh, Rochan said, hey, there was a search party out for him in week one at APB. Well, you can cancel that. Danny Machocha's big back is back, and he's back in a big way. He had over 100. Uh, and again, Montreal, they're starting to close that gap. They're starting to steal some of the A-level talent in Quebec from Laval that normally would just by default either go to Laval or the NCAA. Byron Archambault is a great example of that, the great hybrid linebacker. Uh, and Machocha has the allure of being a former CFL coach with CFL ties. If you want to play in the CFL, you can do it through me. And he has the ability to sell a great city. I mean, I've been to Quebec City, but Montreal is one of the best cities in the world. And again, it, it, the Caravan are closing the gap. They're narrowing the gap. They're stealing some of those A-level talent players in Quebec, and they're doing a great job of taking the B-level talent and really producing them and, and helping them uh, with great resources to become better players. Well, speaking of A-level talent getting lost to the CFL, Sherbrooke defeating it. McGill 46-14, pretty impressive to see Sherbrooke putting up these points, even against McGill, Sherbrooke lo- losing two great players, two of their great receivers to the CFL in the offseason. Is, Sher- is it just because McGill's struggling right now, or is it because Sherbrooke looks like they're ready to take that next step to where they don't have to rebuild every four years where they can reload? Well, I mean, even in a win, you can look convincing or unconvincing. And Laval looked unconvincing in a win. I think Sherbrooke, for me, looked convincing, even though the opponent was the weaker McGill. Uh, You talked about the great receivers they lost. They've taken Sebastian Blanchard, and they put him in Charbel Campanato's spot, and he's flourished. And he had four grabs for a 149 this week, and he's just a sophomore. He's going to be there for another two, maybe three years after this. Um, Again, McGill... The losing streak continues. It gets to 22 right now, and they're really they're, they're not having you know mental mistakes. Uh, they, they didn't have a lot of penalties in this game. It really, it's it's physical mistakes. They they just don't have the athletes. They only had two first downs in the first half. I mean, when you're throwing your defense out there that often, often you can't sustain drives. It's tough, and I think that's a real reason why McGill is uh, trying to be instated in the OUA as early as next year because they're a school who, you know, they're not getting the great kids from Quebec, the French-speaking kids. They're going to um, Montreal and Sherbrooke and obviously Laval, and they're not getting a lot of the English kids. So they're deciding maybe we'll have better luck if we go to the OUA and we just recruit English-speaking uh, kids in Ontario that, you know, if we're playing on in the OUA against uh, Ontario schools, their parents can see them play, and we're virtually, you know, we'll take the long bus trips and possible flights to Windsor, but we think that's our better route recruiting because what they're doing right now is not working. And they have interlocked this week with the Quebec conference with the AUS, so we'll go to the AUS now on Friday night, St. FX, putting up pounding on Mount, on Mount Allison. Strange box score, if you look at it, even though it was X 151-5, to five, they only scored three touchdowns on offense. X's defense looking fabulous, though, with, with Ron O'Mara. What do, you, what do you think about X? Could they be able to take a step into the AUS championship this year? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, they're going to have to finish, especially, as you mentioned, on offense. They left a lot of points on the board. They settled for three short field goals. Um, but it, it's they've they've always had the athletes, and that's not different this year. I mean, look at a guy like Damone Williams. I mean, he, physically, no one on that Mount Allison team can match up with him, and and he dominated. And uh, Mount A, there's not a team that's going to beat themselves. They, they only have three penalties, but they just physically can't compete. They're not at the same level as a Saint Effects or an Acadia, uh, and so it's going to be tough. Uh, I, I I expect. Chain effects to be there because again uh, they, they've got the great athletes. But the thing with them is they always have. You look at a guy like Akeem Foster, or Enoch Mwamba, the guys who have gone on and had great su- success in the CFL. You look at all the great talent that's come out of there, and then you wonder, well, wait a minute, why have they not won more games at the CIS level? So I think it, it, it's not just having the, the ability on the field; it's putting it together. And, and we'll see if this year is finally the year. Well. Uh, St. Mary's looks like they're about to take a step down, losing this weekend 21-16. to St. Mary's only 68 players on their roster. And speaking of Jack Crane, after the game, he got he got knocked out. He was asleep on the field for after a big hit he took in the fourth quarter. 
So Katie up twenty one sixteen is Kyle Graves for real. Uh, I think so. I mean, if if uh, what he does offensively is not enough, and he was the best player on the field uh, this weekend, and he's probably you know for my money the best player in the conference. No disrespect to Jameet Taylor, but a high level quarterback is just more valuable than a high level returner and an offensive player. Um, and if that's not enough. The guy also punts for a 46.5 yard average in the game, uh, and all but one kick, which Jimmy Taylor took to the house. Uh, he did a great job of directional kicking. Um, he's just so valuable to what they do on offense and, and on special teams. And when you have an elite quarterback like that, it just brings the level up of everyone else in your program because they say, okay, we have a shot. If we just do our job, we know we've got a guy back there who can win us some games on their own and you see that St. Mary's team they've got great athletes as well but they don't have that elite quarterback and they haven't had one since Eric Glavich decided he was going to transfer to Calgary a lot of people thought Jack Creighton could have been the guy and this is now his second stint trying to be the guy you have a guy like Ben Rossung who you know is putting some pressure on him looking over his shoulder once he's eligible to play in the future uh, but you know Perry Martini has some tough decisions uh, on his hand moving forward because again you know in Canadian football it's an offensive league and the most important position offensively is the guy who touches the ball on every play no not the center the quarterback. Terry Cummins has a great one at Acadia. Perry Marchese is looking to get a great one. So the interlock this weekend has to be Acadia versus Laval for the big game, the first night game in Laval's history at Pep Stadium. Take us through what the atmosphere is going to be for that one. You mentioned earlier how you can't win there. Imagine playing there now at night. Yeah, and it really will be, you know, a, a, a possible preview of, of what a bowl game might look like later in the year, and you mentioned uh, it, add that uh, the fact that it, it's going to be later and it's going to be at night, and, uh, you know, the thousands that are going to be, you know, uh, pre-drinking and, and tailgating, well, they're going to have the entire day to, to get really ready and revved up for this game. And, you know, timing in life is everything. And uh, it's for Acadia, you don't want to get a Laval team, especially a Laval uh, defense, that's licking their wounds. And they didn't lose to Bishops, but they didn't feel like they played as well as they could have or should have. Uh, I, you know that, especially coming back at home, they're going to be revved up for this. Uh, the struggle for Laval uh, when they try to not rebound but reload every year and go after championships is there's so many games where uh, players are not stupid. They've played against these guys in high school and in, in summer leagues and summer camps they know where the good players are and they know that some t- t- weekends they've won a game before they got off the bus and that the other team has no business uh, playing with them Laval will know this weekend that that's not the case Acadia is a team that can play with them and they're going to get revved up for this game and, and I'm excited to see how it turns out it's going to be a good test to see is Acadia possibly the best team from the AUS or is Acadia possibly one of the best teams in the country That's a good question to ask right now, especially since people are saying this is a down year in the AUS. Now, just finally, there's a new rule in Canadian amateur football that actually is having a big influence on games. For those who don't know, if your helmet comes off on the field of play, you have to sit out for three plays. And we've seen this happen a few times over the course of the year. This weekend especially, Jack Crane's helmet came off on a first down play with two minutes left in the second half or in the second quarter and he had to leave for three plays do you see this rule being amended do you see there's any benefit to this rule or do you think that this is overstepping this concussion error that we're in in football well this is a rule that that started at the amateur level and has moved up and you know a lot of people think rules start from the CFL level and move down. And sometimes, you know, the the CIS will look at rules that the CFL has implemented and consider implementing, but they really, they get their guidance from the amateur level. And the reason why this rule was put in and you had to sit out three plays uh, was because of this. The thought behind it was, with all these helmets that are popping off, uh, it's probably because there's not enough air in the helmet. In not having enough air in your helmet is one way that you could possibly get a concussion, but also it could fly off and and it could be dangerous for yourself or for others. So they figured three plays gives 
the equipment staff enough time to put more air in the helmet and also uh, for the guys who, you know, just may have a loose chin strap or something like that or don't want to do their, their chin straps all the way up because of style reasons, uh, well, if they have to sit on the sideline, um, they probably will think otherwise and they'll amend their equipment appropriately. Now, the OUA has decided not to uh, implement this rule, so you can't uh, – compete in a play if you are the ball if you're not the ball carrier and the helmet pops off that that is a penalty um and, and if you're the ball carrier you know a play for all intents and purposes will be blown dead for your safety but the OUA has decided that they're not going to go the extra step uh and ask a player to sit out for three plays and you mentioned uh you know all the talk about concussions and all the awareness uh, and and uh, the scrutiny that comes with concussions, a big part of it for these leagues uh, is, you know, possible insurance issues and legal ramifications. And if someone were to one day decide that their kid had a serious head injury and that the leagues didn't do everything in their power to protect them, uh, this is one way to curtail that and to put something down in writing to give them some standing uh, if it ever got to that point. So that's the issue that that hand, and we might see that play out. Is this rule adopted just by individual conferences, or say in the bowl games, if is that going to be the rule that happens in the bowl game, and the OUA going to have to adapt to that, or is that just individual conferences and the CIS not having that rule? Well, they, well, that's a great point, and you mentioned the bowl games. Uh, when when the bowl games start, the rules default to the, the CIS rule. So that the same would be true. Uh, the the you would have to sit out uh, for three plays. So that as soon as the eight cups over, uh, the CIS rules uh, are in effect. And, and it, you know it could be potentially um, you know a, a, a game changing uh, situation if if you know uh, on second and goal. Uh, Lombala has to come out of uh, the play uh, because of his helmet popped off. And, and also, think about the interpretation of a rule. Well, because uh, you know, let's use that same example. If Lombala has to come off the field because his helmet popped off, uh, Blake Mill could call a timeout and, and say, "Charge that as one play, uh, or one thing that happened since the last occurrence to try his star running back." On the field, so there's a lot of variables in play, and, and how this plays out will be interesting. Uh, but for me, the onus is is on the player. I know there's sometimes there's nothing you can do when you get rough, but for the most part, uh, if your helmet is um, set up properly, it shouldn't fly after him. Well, it'll be interesting to see with the uh, with the uh, rules coming in, and now the pressure is going to be on the equipment managers as well. But with that, thank you very much, Donovan, for joining us on this podcast. I'm Kevin Garbuyo. We'll talk to you all next week. Thanks very much.